Why Jesus is our series topic. Uh, we've handled the church we can be and I've launched my new book. If you haven't bought it, you're positively sinful and need to buy it today. And, uh, but we've done a series on, on Jesus being the leader of his church and how he operates and works through his people. And what we felt as a pastoral team is to, to focus specifically on him, his worth and his work, and the amazing work, because the Easter celebration is, I guess, the key, the key Christian celebration on, on, our, on our calendar. And so we want to focus a few messages just on Jesus. And I hope that uh, my thoughts today will be helpful. And uh, the question we're raising is, why the Passover? You say, Passover, what the heck is that? Well, if you've been reading the book of Exodus in our daily readings, you would have come across the Passover. Passover, what's Passover? Passover, Passover. Something to do about passing over. It's in the early chapters of Exodus because Jesus takes this amazing festival that the ancient Hebrews had been outworking for something like uh, 1,200 years. Every year, same time, same place, they would have this festival and Jesus transforms it and makes it into what we call the Lord's Supper. And uh, it speaks to us of who he is. You see, Jesus unmistakably says that this Old Testament celebration pointed to him. And the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and rulers and Herodians and all of those people hated him for saying that. <laughs> he basically said, a greater than Moses is here. Whoa! And yet, there was no egotism and no pride. He was just so humble. And no one could accuse him of of arrogance or conceit or pride, but he basically said, that ceremony points to me. I'm the fulfillment of it. And so the religious leaders went crazy, but the people understood it, that he was the ultimate fulfillment of all that this ceremony speaks about and, and is meant to convey. And so Jesus, before he's crucified, on a cross, he shares the Passover and he dies in the midst of this ceremony time. And so he gets his disciples together and in Luke 22, he says, then came the day of unleavened bread. Now, why is it unleavened bread? Question, I'll answer it in a few moments. On which the Passover lamb had been sacrificed, a little lamb that had been killed and its blood has to be spread in the temple courts in certain areas. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now, let's jump into Exodus, get a little bit of the background of what we're talking about here. When it first began, the first mention of the Passover is in Exodus chapter 12, and it's a time of crisis for Israel. What's the crisis? This people group had been held as slaves under a tyrannical regime, the pharaohs of Egypt. For 430 years, they were slaves, building the great cities and the empire that became the Egyptian empire. They were suffering. There was terrible violence, premature deaths, the abuse of power. Slavery has always been evil. It's, it's, it's a, a shocking, shocking indictment on the human condition and it speaks of ultimately the end result of sin, that we think we're gods over other people, that we replace God and we think we can actually dominate and control a person, their total life. And so the, the Hebrews were under terrible oppression, terrible evil. And where that occurs, rape is endemic, violence is endemic, murder, no justice. And uh, the people's cry for help 
was heard by God and he sent a deliverer, a Jesus figure. His name was Moses. And uh, he was sent to talk to Pharaoh, to talk to the Egyptians, to say, you've got to let these people go. They're God's people. Here's a plan and a purpose for them. The Messiah is going to be born through them. The saviour of the world. The gospel was preached to Abraham and to Moses. Somehow God revealed to them the ultimate purpose of why the Hebrew people were called. And so there had to be a deliverance. There had to be a freedom. And so Pharaoh, though, was just this autocratic, monstrous person who just didn't listen to God, didn't listen to, to Moses. And so God had to gradually just show his power by certain plagues. And so plague number one, you'd think would be enough. I mean, plague number one would frighten the living daylights out of you. You'd say, yep, they can go. Second plague, third plague, fourth plague, all the way, 10 plagues. Moses, Pharaoh sort of goes, well, yeah, okay, we'll let you go. Then he changes his heart. He, he's, he's, he's a reprobate. He so hardened his heart that the more miracles that he sees, evidence of God's grace and, and, and goodness and judgment and protection of his people, the harder his heart becomes. So at the end, it's a terrible, the 11th plague is a shocker. Because God was going to come in judgment over the hardness of, this, uh, of, of the Egyptian peoples and, and ultimately every firstborn child Every firstborn animal in Egypt would die on a particular day. This is the final plague, the final thing to say, well, will they ultimately let, will they let the people go? And so, um, so this, was, this is, was the crisis. And now Moses, te God tells Moses what to do on this night when judgment was going to come. And so... I want to read this to you. It says, then they are to take some of the blood. This is the blood of a lamb. And in verse 5 of Exodus 12, it actually says the lamb had to be without defect. Interesting. Had to be a perfect little lamb. Again, that's a symbol, a type, we say, of the perfect lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. As John the Baptist would say, hey, there's Jesus. It's the lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. The angel said to Matthew, said to, to Joseph, said, you've got to name him Jesus because he's going to take away, he's going to heal his people from their sins. He's going to, going to forgive and change people. He's going to deal with the sin question. And so this little lamb had to be perfect and the saviour of the world had to be perfect. He had to be perfectly God and perfectly human. How's that? Totally human, fully God, fully human, and yet to be tested in every area of temptation that you and I get tested in and have to face. And he didn't sin. And so he was the perfect lamb, without blemish, without sin. The only one that could take the sins of the world in a substitutionary way. We should have been punished for our sins, but Jesus was punished for us. Well, this now ceremony, the Passover ceremony is the beginning of this amazing, every year they would do this, but it speaks of Christ. So it says, then they are to take some of the blood of the, of the little slain uh, perfect lamb and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they are to eat the lambs. So they had to, every household had to, to, uh, to slay a lamb. And it's interesting that uh, some households that, that couldn't do it well, they actually said, well, just do it together. It's almost like redemption and community go together. It's like the, 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 the saving, the protecting of people is not an isolated thing. It's to be worked together as a community, which is interesting. And, and have a look at what they did. The, the blood. What did they do? They put the blood, I don't know if you've noticed this before, on the sides. This is the doorway. One side there, one side there, and up top. What does that speak of? Speaks of the cross. It's a symbol of the cross. Blood had to be placed here, here, here. And it says, that same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire 
along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. That's interesting. Again, I don't want to read too much into it, but I think there is a symbol here. There is a type. There's an analogy saying that, that the, the bitter herbs are a reminder. So this ceremony was to be done for hundreds of years, 1,200 years or so. And it was to remind them of the old bitter life that they had of slavery and bondage and to eat bread made without yeast. In other words, this new life you have, try not to put sin in your life because a little bit of yeast in the dough and it spreads it into what we have as bread. So unleavened bread was without yeast. Why? To remind them and say, just make sure this new life that you have, don't embrace sin. Be different to the nations around about you. And I love this one. This is how you'd eat it. With your cloak tucked in your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is a type, an illustration of vigilance and, and preparedness at all times. Now in this new life, we're to be ready. We're ready to march. We're ready to go forward. We're ready to war. And that's what the children of Israel, in getting out of, out of Egypt, it wasn't just a, a Sunday school picnic. It, it was a constant battle for them to possess the land that God had promised them in Canaan. They had to go through the Red Sea, had to cross the wilderness, had to fight a lot of enemies. And so he's saying, come on, eat in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Be vigilant. Be prepared at all times. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a type of Jesus' blood to stave off God's wrath. When his blood flowed from the cross... It covered the sins of the whole world. It covered your sin. And we can receive the effect of it, forgiveness of our sins, the gift of eternal life, peace with God, reconcilia reconciliation with God by simply turning to him and trusting him. That's what repentance and faith is. It's turning from ourselves and putting our trust in him. The blood will be a sign for you. I'm going to pass over you. I'm not going to judge you. See, God cannot look upon sin. Sin has to be dealt with. It's a very serious issue with God. A perfect God cannot have relationship with sinful human beings. It's impossible. But he loves us. He doesn't want to judge us and send us to hell for our sins. And our first parents who sinned. And every human being that's ever been born has sinned. And so God is just, but he's loving. His love found a way by which he could reconcile us to himself. In that I will pass over you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to change you because I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. And so this sacrificial system that, that was created, this Passover, part of the, the feast of Israel, is all a type, an illustration of Jesus Christ and what he would accomplish for us hundreds of years later. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. The blood symbolizes a sacrifice offered as a substitute. One life laid down for another. You can read that in Leviticus 17. Israel escapes the judgment about to fall on Egypt through the mediation of this sacrificial act. And it all was a statement to say, ultimately, one day, God himself is going to be the sacrificial lamb. He is going to be the one, his own son. So Israel never forgot their safe exodus from Egypt by, by the supernatural intervention of God. And every year, the Passover festival commemorated this divine deliverance from their 400 years of bondage as slaves. And, and it was etched into their memory. See, remembering invokes thanksgiving, thankfulness. It, it evokes gratitude. That's what worship is. Now, we don't kind of get it regarding slavery. Because we think, oh, you know, like, 400 years of slavery. If you know about American history, and I used to teach it at... Uh, uh, the, the issue of race relations in America, we don't really understand it. But you've got to understand this. 
There were four million slaves that for 250 years were treated as property. And they created the American economy down south. And when they got liberated in 1863 by a presidential decree and then constitutional amendment 1865, see the film Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln, fantastic, is these people were just used to living in bond, had no rights. So, so a man could marry a girl, it wasn't a legal marriage, they just did their own stuff, but then the slave owner could sell the, the wife or the child somewhere else, they go to another state. So then he starts another family, like he gets married because he doesn't know where she is, alive, dead, whatever. So you had a social structure that was just so bad. The only hope that these people had was actually coming together in church and they created their own preachers, and, and that's the only time when the slave, slave owners could not be there. It was just that the, the, And so when they got liberated in 1863, 1865, the president, President Lincoln, who got saved in 1862, he wanted to compensate them. He wanted to give them a whole pile of money. He wanted to get them out of the South and, and get them into the West and give them pieces of land. But he got killed on Good Friday. And the black community said, he's our saviour. They called him Father Abraham. They viewed him as a Christ-like figure who brought them out of bondage. And if he had his way, he would have compensated them. So today, so these four million black men and women were liberated, had nothing, not a cent to their names. No property, no money, yet they created the economy of the South. They started like that. So 250, 250 years later, the memory, fathers talk to their sons, and say, it's still there. The sense of, you know what? And, and you talk to African Americans and they understand the feeling bondage and slavery is, is part of the, their thinking process. It runs very, very deep. And so these Israelites, 430 years of bondage, even into Jesus' day, they would remember, they would talk about. It was all passed through. Remember what it was like. We were slaves, we were in bondage. And, and we don't have a lot of understanding of that because we live in such a, a, a wonderful country where slavery is outlawed and, and uh, oppression is, is uh, something that we, we fight against. So this is a really big issue for them. So when they would celebrate every year, they're thinking of liberation, freedom, freedom from oppression. And so Jesus takes this ceremony and changes it in this New Testament era. And he says, now I'm going to tell you the ultimate deliverance that, that God has in mind. And that's a deliverance from sin, from Satan, from eternal death, not just from human oppressors. And so when the Messiah came, some thought, oh, well, he's going to do to the Romans what Moses did to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Beat them up, get rid of them. They're looking for a political, a social deliverance. But Jesus came to deal with the root issue within the heart of man, the heart of humanity, which is alienation from God the Father, the root of sin within. He had to deal with that so that people could be forgiven and be given the gift of eternal life and live forever and ever. And so this is why he says this, go back to Luke 22. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, before I go to the cross. This is before Gethsemane and before the cross. And he's telling them that he has to die, but he's going to rise again. But they, still, they didn't quite get it, his disciples. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance. Remember me. Remember what I'm going to do for you. Just like the Hebrews had to remember what God did through Moses in delivering them from physical persecution, slavery, just remember, I'm going to deliver you from the slavery to sin and bondage to Satan. In the same way, after, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
And here he institutes the great Christian ceremony of Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. And we're going to take it together in, in, in a few minutes' time. And the reason why we do it is you need an ordinance, you need a ceremony. And we endeavour to do it once a month in our, each of our services. We encourage our connect groups to also do it as often as they can because it, it centres you back to what it's all about. That you can forget, oh, it's about church. It's about people. It's about relationships. And then actually, more fundamentally, it's about Jesus and who he is and what he did on a cross that has effect today in our lives. It helps us to be thankful to be grateful and to appropriate in our lives today the benefits of the salvation he has provided. It helps center us upon the cross and not deviate from it. It helps us focus on Jesus and who he really is and our relationship with him. There's a famous sermon that was uh, preached by uh, Jonathan Edwards in the 1740s or, or 50s and uh, in the Great Awakening Revival. You can Google this if you like. It's a great awakening in, in, the, in the eastern coast of America of a revival 100 years or so after the British and, and others had landed and, and so they were Christians when they landed. Then within 100 years they kind of became pretty pagan. So there's this massive awakening of a religious revival and Jonathan Edwards was the, the, uh, the key key pastor who brought over a, a, a famous preacher called George Whitfield and, and you've got to read about it. it's amazing what took place tens of thousands of people came to Christ new churches were birthed and his famous sermon it's a fantastic sermon but man it's got a lousy title it's called sinners in the hands of an angry God the content is terrific but the title is awful in this 20th, 21st century, God raised up another Jonathan Edwards, the greatest evangelist soul winner the world has ever seen. Who preached personally to 210 million people and probably through his television and radio ministry, maybe another couple of billion people. Whether it was in Africa, whether it was in the communist bloc, whether it was in the United States, this farm boy from North Carolina, lanky kid who just didn't know why God chose him, became a lightning rod for probably the, one of the greatest revivals in human history. Historians are saying, I just watched Henry Kissinger say, that we think Billy Graham helped destroy communism by his preaching of the gospel. He gave hope to people. He, he stirred up the religious senses within people and uh, and so he was able and yet he was opposed going there he went to 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 South Africa he wouldn't preach there because of apartheid and finally the apartheid government allowed him in in 1972 73 and you know what he preaches on apartheid is doomed it's recorded like bold and Nelson Mandela loved him and and uh, and, and so he was just you know, he was a good friend of Martin Luther King Jr. He bailed him out of jail when they were arresting him. And uh, Martin Luther King would come and pray at his, his services. And, and, uh, and, and Martin Luther King said, you're probably doing more than what I can do because you're changing people's hearts. God's using you to change people's hearts. I'm just a social activist. And, uh, and so uh, they said, you can't go preaching in the South. You know, he said, I'm not coming down there unless you desegregate. Way before the laws were changed, the early 50s. He said, no. And he himself would come down and break the barriers and the head deacons would resign on him. He said, oh, you don't want black people sitting here and what? He goes, no, because I'm not coming. He goes, and I've, they've said I can come. I want everyone together. Amazing human being. But you know what stands out? As Edwards would say, sinners in the hands of an angry God. But I don't think we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. I think we are lost helpless and hopeless sinners in the hands of a loving God. And Billy Graham personified this. And he went to heaven a couple of weeks ago. And for those of us who were deeply influenced by him, like I was, it feels like a death in the family. 
But my Christian life in coming to Christ, probably Leo Harris, the founder of our CRC movement, and was probably the most influential person, but then probably Billy Graham in the early set. I just loved watching, getting his films and watching them and, and as this great event, and I tried to copy him when I was evangelizing in the schools. I tried to get a North Carolina drawl, but it didn't work. I loved him. I loved the fact that he was able to proclaim with such boldness the gospel of Christ, but with the most loving disposition you can find. And um, when his son, Franklin Graham, in fact, I was, I, tr- I, tried to, I tried to go to two Billy Graham conferences, one in Louisville, Kentucky, Kathy came with me and my dad, and, and also in Amsterdam 2000, and the great man was going to be there. But he got sick both times, <laughs> both times. And, oh, man, like, but, uh, but I learned so much from those conferences. But, you know, when his son, Franklin Graham, came and did this campaign here, and uh, some of us were able to meet him and talk with him. And I, and I had a talk with him. I said, Franklin, I'd like you to, to, I want to tell you a story. I'd like you to pass it on to your dad. He goes, all right. I told him, I said, well, in 1959, when I mean, your dad was preaching at Wayville, there was a little boy. He was about 11 years of age. A few years earlier, he was sexually abused by a farmhand. And this little kid was really broken. But he made a decision for Jesus didn't quite understand but then his teenage years he lost his way had suicidal tendencies and by 21 years of age had the gun loader ready to blow his brains out and when Ray Betcher told me the story and I want to record this in 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 probably the book I'm going to write on the witness I can be it's not in in the me I can be Ray story he remembered what Billy said at Wayville showground about heaven and hell and about you shall not kill and lie and steal. And this overwhelming feeling came over this, this suicidal young man. He said, you can't take life. If you even take your own life, you're judging yourself to hell and damnation. That's how he felt. So with that, he calls out to God, ends up re- giving his life to Christ, not as a child, but as an adult, getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I told Franklin, the Christian Family Center was birthed. I said so, and I explained the story of the Christian Family Center, how many thousands of people we've, we've been able to touch. I said, tell your dad that story of the little boy who heard the gospel, who would have been dead if it wasn't for the message of life. And kind of Franklin's eyes nearly popped out of his head. I said, tell him. I said, this is a story of hope. So, so we, our heritage goes back to, to the, great, the great man. 